Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who like books. My name is Heather Wardover, and I'm podcasting from my corner of the Sonoran Desert, the Old Pueblo, Tucson, Arizona. Episode 78, Cue the Monster. This episode of Craft Lit brought to you by Knitting Out Loud. Listen while you knit. Well, hello! I hope you have all had a wonderful week. I actually have. I have finished my semester at the university. I have collected all 4,000 finals and 8,000 drafts that I have to read. (laughs) Draft revisions. I told the kids that they could revise papers until the end of the semester because, of course, as a writing teacher, my job is to encourage them to write. I've never really had students take me up on this (laughs) until now. Oh, dear Lord. I have so many papers to grade this weekend. I should be grading them right now, but... um, But I'm not. I'm podcasting, and I'm kind of happy about that. I imagine you can tell from my voice that I am feeling much better. It's so good to be able to breathe. Whatever medication they have put me on, it's all working. I'm very happy. It's it's an enormous relief. Ooh, I just took a deep breath right there. Oh, it's such a wonderful thing. I'm so happy. And I'm happy about a bunch of other stuff, too. I actually have been working on the website. I don't know if you've been to the Blogspot version of the show notes. Actually, make sure you do go there because um, Dawn sent a really funny link last week. And there was also a picture that I forgot to tell you about um, of a, a glass spinning wheel. A working, sorry, a working glass spinning wheel. You kind of have to see it to believe it. I'd be afraid to spin on it, but they say you can. I'm not sure how, because the treadles are also glass, but, but there it is. Uh, The other thing I've done is I've actually raised the library up into its own column, so you can now find episodes much more quickly and efficiently. And part of that is responding to a listener concern, oh, Lord, months ago, saying that it was very hard to find specific chapters. Like, if you, if you know that you left off on a certain chapter and you haven't listened for a while, and you're trying to find that chapter again, but you can't remember which episode it was in, well, what I'm doing now is systematically going through all of the show notes and finding out which chapters came when, and I'm including that information in the little tag for the library. So you should be able to find this information rather quickly and easily uh, very soon. It's taking me a while, and some of it's easier to track down than others, but there it is. I also wanted to let those of you who wrote to me about Scott Brick and having listened to his work and liking his work, I wanted to let you know that I forwarded some of your comments to him and he was so overwhelmed and just tickled pink. He actually listened to one of our episodes um, and and not just the one where I said nice things about him, but um, but you really made his day. And, and again, I hope if you haven't listened to books that he's recorded, I hope that you do someday and um, and notice that it's it's him who's reading, because he is um, he is quite quite good at his job and really, again, a wonderful guy. I also wanted to send an enormous thank you out to our wonderful German listeners who came to my call, my cry of desperation, and um, we now have I think a plan. If something should happen with my sister. And the young man who she has fallen head over heels for, who we all love. He's just wonderful. Um, if something should happen now, there is a plan in place to uh, surprise them and, and fet them and make them very happy and probably kind of fat. And that's a good thing. I've also gotten some wonderful, wonderful emails just to me in uh, in the last couple of weeks, catching up on on my health and and checking in with me and and just letting me know that you're there. And it's it's been wonderful. I will have the um, drawing for the November charm next week. I haven't finished printing out all of the the papers from donations, and I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. So. I am double checking myself on that and then next week we will have our second to the last drawing. December will be the last one. 
shocking. I can't believe how fast time is flying. It is currently, for those of you who are listening in the present, it is Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, and um, I, I can't believe it. <laughs> There's a part of my brain that refuses to believe it. Time is just passing way too quickly. I'm not I'm not real happy about that, but there's not much I can do about it either. <laughs> Time has a funny way of doing that to me. Um, on the crafty front, before we get to Frankenstein, because I have lots of treats for you today with Frankenstein, I have been weaving up a storm. I have actually gotten my husband to help me warp the loom a couple of times now because I've had to warp so quickly. And it um, warping is still, for me, the most challenging part. And I've tried to make the whole process a little bit easier by tying a warp on to a warp that's already on the loom. So I had a very, very long, like a 12 or 14 yard warp on that I was doing a funky double weave thing with. For those of you who don't know what double weave is, it's magic. I don't know how to explain it other than that. But what you do is because of the way you treadle, and it's totally a treadling thing, you wind up weaving the top portion of the fabric and a turn and the bottom portion of the fabric. So for those of you who buy fabric to sew with, you know how it always has a selvage edge and a folded edge? I am actually weaving the selvage edge, two selvages, and a folded edge but I'm weaving it all at once. So if I weave something that is 12 inches wide on the loom, it will be 24 inches wide when I take it off the loom. Isn't that cool? Oh my God, I was so excited. So I was doing something very, very simple and basic, but I wanted to really play with it and see if I could make shawls or see if I could, I didn't know what I was going to do. And then all of a sudden I realized I needed to weave some actual Christmas presents for my sister and her boyfriend. So I got some chenille yarn and I tied it on to the warp that I had. So I, I cut off what I'd been working on, took those loose edges and tied the new warp on. It happened to be the same number of ends, so it was very easy to do. And, uh, and then I just pulled those knots, <laughs> pulled those knots through the reeds on the beater and through the heddles. For those of you who don't have weaving looms, this means I pulled an overhand knot through spaces that were about maybe two to three millimeters wide on the reed and maybe slightly larger than that, three millimeters, maybe three and a half on the heddles. <laughs> it reminds me of a Douglas Adams moment where the book says, this is of course impossible. Uh, people say in books and magazines that it's really easy to do and you just have to jiggle the yarn. <clears throat> I jiggled. I did eventually manage to accomplish this and I did weave really spectacular chenille scarves that are linked in color but not the same. So they have the same variegated yarn as a background yarn but different solids. One is a dark blue and one is a dark green and I'm giving the scarves to them. She, my sister's going to take them to Germany. She doesn't know what they are and um, they can open the packages together and they can duke it out over who gets what scarf when and of course if, if they stay together then they both get to wear each scarf when they want to. I guess it's encouraging unity. That's what I'm trying to do with this present is encourage them to stay together so that they have access to the same clothes all the time. Because I have to say, chenille, I, I've tried knitting with it once and I hated it. I really, really loathed working with it. I was trying to knit um, a ch child's toy and it just kept pilling and doing all this weird stuff and pieces of it were falling off. And of course you can't rip it out if you make a mistake because then it really has trouble and starts falling apart. I could also have been using cheap chenille. I don't know. I know there are people who knit with it. I'm not one of them though. Weaving with it was a completely different experience. And the really funky thing is as soft as the yarn itself is, when you weave it into a scarf, it comes off the loom like, like a piece of cardboard. It's hard as a rock and it it feels like it's going to crackle when you fold it and and then you're scared and then you take it and you wash it with in my case some eucalyn you get that lanolin in there you swish it around for a while 
rinse out the water, air dry it as long as you can, and then stick it in the dryer for the last, you know, 10, 10 minute fluff dry things. And oh my goodness, it shrinks up a little bit, yes. And the fringe, you have to leave extra long because the fringe, interestingly enough, shrinks up the most. I didn't notice a whole lot of shrinkage in the width or in the length, but those loose pieces at the end, um, it went from a, a four to five inch fringe to maybe a two to three inch fringe. That's a lot of shrinking. But my goodness, these things are so unbelievably soft. I'm just overwhelmed. I'm all into weaving with chenille now. <laughs> and, and I will figure out a way to get the knots through the heddles easier. So that was one of my adventures this week. My other adventure has been going back to the Guayabara shirt that I was knitting for my husband that I got out of the Knit One Green magazine, the issue that they released. I think it was over the summer. The The pattern is, the, the picture in the magazine is beautiful. The pattern is not the same as the picture in the magazine. I'm a good enough knitter that if I want it to look like the magazine, darn it, I can do that. So I have been systematically ripping back on things that I had already joined. So I'm deconstructing the shirt and re-knitting specific portions. And it will be worth it. There is no question, it will be worth it. It is. It already looks better. The side that I have fixed already looks so much better. But my goodness, is this a pain in the butt. And I'm just irked because you know, it didn't have to be so hard. It didn't have to be this way. It really didn't. But it is, and I'm gonna. I'm really trying to get it done for Christmas. I'm totally missed Hanukkah with this one, but uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. I hope I will, because I'm also spinning some of that fabulous merino silk blend that I told you about that my friend Debbie Brenner uh, makes. Oh my goodness, heaven, heaven, heaven to spin. I'm spinning that, and uh, and I'm hoping that I will finish that in time to actually knit the socks for the people I want to give socks to. But the spinning's going slowly because I have finals, I have writing, I have the quiet bar shirt, I've had this weaving thing. I'm, I am not where the yarn harlot is with her list of all, she has a schedule for all the knitting she needs to do to be done in time for Christmas and she's ahead. I am so not. It's just like with the National Novel Writing Month, I made it halfway. I am really proud of myself for making it halfway. But it's exactly the same thing that happened to me with the Knitting Olympics. I engage, I'm really excited, and then life happens, and I can't finish. I don't have a complex about this yet, but I probably should. Someday. Someday I will get a complex, and I'll share it with you then. But right now I'm, I'm still hopeful. I think next year, next year I'll have a plot. And when I have a plot, I think I'll have a real reason for finishing a novel. As it is, I have a really interesting character study. I'm very happy with it, but it's, it's so not a novel. Oh, well. But the spinning is proceeding, and I'm trying something different this time. I'm actually making half of the spinning portable. I'm once again doing the fractal spinning, like you saw in the spin-off magazine uh, two issues ago, where there's an article from Janelle Laidman of Spindelicity.com about how to split roving so that you can get the striping on the knitting, the, the way that the yarn stripes, you can get it to, to stripe a specific way when you knit it up. And I really liked how it came up on my pair of socks, so I'm trying to do that again. What that means is I have one very fat piece of roving, which is what I'm doing on my wheel, and then I have a ball of very thin, like pinky finger or smaller thin roving, and I'm using a large-ish spindle to spin that. I'm doing the same weight of yarn on both the spinning wheel and the spindle, so I can make sure that when I ply it will look uniform, but I but I am spinning in two completely different, I don't want to say mediums, but mediums. And uh, we'll see how it works out. I have no idea what's going to happen. It'll probably be a disaster and I'll be telling you all about it next week. But for now, I'm really excited. So that's my crafty life right now, the craft part of the lid. And I've also been, while I've been doing all these things, listening to Frankenstein. This week I'm bringing you three chapters, and I have to. 
because the first two chapters we're going to listen to, it's about half an hour of chapter three and chapter four. Chapter three and four are Victor telling Walton all about his childhood and eventually his schooling. And you really, really need to understand Victor. It's crucial to the rest of the book. So it, it kind of feels ponderous in some parts, and it also kind of feels, um, well, a little on the dull side, because you're kind of sitting there waiting for the movie part <laughs> to start. <laughs> Where's that guy with the nodes on his neck? Um, this this opening part you have to remember is Victor talking so Victor is going to tell you all sorts of things the important thing to remember while you are listening to Victor talking is this Mary was 18 when she wrote this book that was the summer that they were in the castle and Byron came up with this idea that since it was raining and gloomy outside and they were all reading ghost stories to each other that they should compete and see who could write the best ghost story and Mary won the competition. Two years later, after a lot more writing and heavy editing, um, the book was published and it was a, a great success. But she was 18 when she wrote this. She was 16 when she ran away with Percy. Shelley was married to a woman named Harriet at the time, and shortly after this challenge for writing the book, before it was published, Harriet, Percy's actual wife, pregnant with his child, drowned herself in the Thames. Shelley had to go back for the inquest to prove that he didn't throw her in the Thames, exonerated himself, went back to Mary, and then they get married, and have a tense but reasonably happy marriage until he dies. I know, lots of fun, right? Again, she's 18 when she writes this. She's 18 when she conceives of this Victor Frankenstein. And you have to keep in mind, aside from the fact that she's 18, that she lost her mother when she was a baby. She was born, her mom died a week or two later, she never knew her mom. She was raised by her father, and she was raised among great intellects and great writers. So, I find, personally, I find her first two chapters where she details Victor's life to be breathtakingly brilliant, beautifully written, and they set you up so perfectly for what will happen next that you you won't even see it coming. That's how good it is. So as you listen, just kind of let it wash over you. Don't worry about the details too much. I will remind you of details that matter when they're going to matter. But for now, just kind of get a big, broad picture of Victor's schooling and his prejudices and his biases and his interests and also listen to, I find it interesting anyway, listen to how interesting it is how science has changed and the perception of science has changed. And never, never forget that the people who this book are populated with are people created by a romantic capital R. This is people reacting to the age of reason, the enlightenment, and they are enamored of things like supernatural events and um, kind of windswept stormy terrain and nature's beauty in both its glory as in you know a glorious sunset or a spectacular sunrise but also in nature's beauty in that kind of tempest tossed rocky coast of Maine with a slate gray sly, sky and the the waves beating on the rocks with you know this fabulous stormy ocean all of that was beautiful to them all of that was grand and I think that's that's where they found their spirituality that's where they found their connection to a larger world and meaning and 
importance and depth and you hear all of that coming through in in Victor the other thing that you will hear them value over and over again in this book is friendship and family and so with that I'm going to let you start off on chapters three and four of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley when I had attained the age of 17 my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever. Her illness was severe and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had at first yielded to her entreaties, but when she heard that the life of her favourite was menaced, she could no longer control her anxiety. She attended her sickbed. Her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved, but the consequences of this imprudence were fatal to her preserver. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms, and the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of this best of women did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed in the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to my younger children. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you, and, happy and beloved as I have been, is it not hard to quit you all? But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavour to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she whom we saw every day and whose very existence appeared part of our own can have departed forever, that the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished and the sound of a voice, so familiar and dear to the ear, can be hushed, never more to be heard. These are the reflections of the first days. But when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. Yet from whom has not the rude hand rent away some dear connection? And why should I describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity, and the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead, but we had still duties we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest, and learn to think ourselves fortunate, whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks. It appeared to me sacrilege so soon to leave the repose akin to death of the house of mourning and to rush into the thick of life. I was new to sorrow, but it did not the less alarm me. I was unwilling to quit the sight of those that remained to me, and above all I desired to see my sweet Elizabeth in some degree consoled. She indeed veiled her grief and strove to act the comforter to us all. She looked steadily on life and assumed its duties with courage and zeal. She devoted herself to those whom she had been taught to call her uncle and cousins. Never was she so enchanting as at this time, when she recalled the sunshine of her smiles and spent them upon us. She forgot even her own regret in her endeavours to make us forget. The day of my departure at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavoured to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me and to become my fellow-student, but in vain. 
his father was a narrow-minded trader, and saw idleness and ruin in the aspirations and ambition of his son. Henry deeply felt the misfortune of being debarred from a liberal education. He said little, but when he spoke, I read in his kindling eye and in his animated glance a restrained but firm resolve not to be chained to the miserable details of commerce. We sat late. We could not tear ourselves away from each other, nor persuade ourselves to say the word farewell. It was said, and we retired under the pretense of seeking repose, each fancying the other was deceived. But when at morning's dawn I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, they were all there. My father again to bless me, Clerval to press my hand once more, my Elizabeth to renew her entreaties that I would write often and to bestow the last feminine attentions on her playmate and friend. I threw myself into the chaise that was to convey me away and indulged in the most melancholy reflections. I, who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavouring to bestow mutual pleasure, I was now alone. In the university whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkably secluded and domestic, and this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clerval. These were old familiar faces, but I believed myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey. But as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place, and had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with, and it would indeed have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length, the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning I delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. Chance, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction, which asserted omnipotent sway over me from the moment I turned my reluctant steps from my father's door, led me first to Monsieur Kremp, professor of natural philosophy. He was an uncouth man, but deeply imbued in the secrets of his science. He asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I replied carelessly, and partly in contempt, mentioned the names of my alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. Have you, he said, really spent your time in studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute, continued Monsieur Crimp with warmth, every instant that you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God! In what desert land have you lived, where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies which you have so greedily imbibed are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient? I little expected, in this enlightened and scientific age, to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus? My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of several books treating of natural philosophy which he desired me to procure and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week he intended to commence a course of lectures upon natural philosophy in its general relations, and that Monsieur Waltman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate days he omitted. I returned home not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered those authors useless whom the professor reprobated, but I returned not at all the more inclined to recur to these studies in any shape. Monsieur Kremp was a little squat man with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favour of his pursuits. In rather a too philosophical and connected strain, perhaps, I have given an account of the conclusions I had come to concerning them in my early years. As a child, I had not been content with the results promised by the modern professors of natural science. With a confusion of ideas only to be accounted for by my extreme youth and my want of a guide on such matters, I had retrod the steps of knowledge along the paths of time, and exchanged the discoveries of recent inquirers for the dreams of forgotten alchemists. B. 
Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern natural philosophy. It was very different when the masters of the science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand. But now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions on which my interest in the science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange shimmers of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days of my residence at Ingolstadt, which were chiefly spent in becoming acquainted with the localities and the principal residents in my new abode. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which M. Kremp had given me concerning the lectures, and although I could not consent to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of the pulpit, I recollected what he had said of M. Waltman, whom I had never seen, as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity, and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room which M. Waltman entered shortly after. This professor was very unlike his colleague. He appeared about fifty years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few grey hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short but remarkably erect, and his voice the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing with fervour the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science, and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, he said, promised impossibilities, and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted, and that the excelsior of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature, and show how she works in our hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates, and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. Such were the professor's words. Rather, let me say, such the words of the fate announced to destroy me. As he went on, I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy. One by one, the various keys were touched which formed the mechanism of my being. Chord after chord was sounded, and soon my mind was filled with one thought, one conception, one purpose. So much has been done, exclaimed the soul of Frankenstein. More, far more will I achieve. Treading in the steps already marked, I will pioneer a new way, explore unknown powers, and unfold to the world the deepest mysteries of creation. I closed my eyes that night. My internal being was in a state of insurrection and turmoil. I felt that order would thence arise, but I had no power to produce it. By degrees, after the morning's dawn, sleep came. I awoke, and my yesternight's thoughts were as a dream. There only remained a resolution to return to my ancient studies, and to devote myself to a science for which I believe myself to possess a natural talent. On the same day I paid M. Waltman a visit. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lectures, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affability and kindness. I gave him pretty nearly the same account of my former pursuits as I had given his fellow professor. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that M. Kremp had exhibited. He said that these were men to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us, as an easier task, to give new names and arrange in connected classifications the facts which they, in a great degree, had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labours of men of genius, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of mankind. I listened to a statement 
which was delivered without any presumption or affectation, and then added that his lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists. I expressed myself in measured terms, with the modesty and deference due from a youth to his instructor, without letting escape, an experience in life would have made me ashamed, any of the enthusiasm which stimulated my intended labours. I requested his advice concerning books I ought to procure. I am happy, said M. Waltman, to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study. But at the same time, I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become really a man of science, and not merely a petty experimentalist, I would advise you to apply to every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure, and promising me the use of his own when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange the mechanism. He also gave me a list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to me. It decided my future destiny. I just wanted to remind those of you who are listening on either iTunes or another kind of MP3 player that recognizes chapters that I am including podcast chapter breaks in um, in each episode so that you can easily fast forward or kind of jump to the beginning of the next chapter. And actually, what I'm doing is I'm I'm clicking to the beginning of the next chapter talk. So. Chapter 3. I don't think there's anything in there that should be hugely shocking to anyone about uh, the way Victor talks about himself, um, except that uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the the guys that he's talking about, the people who he was reading, um, they're all alchemists, the people who thought that you could turn like lead into gold. Um, and again, this is obviously a romantic notion. This is not a surprise it was mentioned in the previous chapter. Um, one of the things that may have surprised you is that when Victor and Elizabeth's mom or Elizabeth's stepmom died, that she made it clear that she had hoped that they would get married. Of course, they're not related by blood, but they are growing up in the same house as brother and sister. And that's always a little odd to us these days. Although it reminded me of, uh, my dad has a friend who was over in Saudi Arabia, and my dad's a geographer who focuses on arid lands, so he and the people he works with are often overseas. And um, one of the guys that they were working with was going to a wedding, and it was first cousins, his first cousins who were getting married, and one of the guys from the United States said, wow, uh, we kind of can't do that in the United States. And the guy said, what, you marry a stranger? And I just thought, man, that that sums up a, a pretty major culture difference. And it's it's kind of true. You know, you do marry someone who you don't actually know very well. I was lucky enough to have known my husband for years by the time we got married. And it made the whole thing very easy and, and peaceful and comfortable and, and quite happy. And it still is. Oh. And and so I, I guess Victor and Elizabeth would be in the same kind of situation. You know, they know they get along well together, and they certainly care about each other. Um, the mother dying early on should make you remember that Mary Shelley's mother died when she was young. And this is going to set Victor up for some interesting, can you say foreshadowing, um, psychological imperatives in Victor's life. Um the 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 other thing of course is that his mother died nobly you know she didn't she didn't die tragically or screaming or you know kicking her way out she she was very calm and she was angelic and she was this and that and it's hard not to imagine that this is mary shelley idealizing her mom um it it would be odd if it weren't i guess is where i'm going with that 
So now we are heading into chapter four, which is more of Victor's schooling, but this is where it actually gets a little twisted. Here we go. Chapter four. From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, became nearly my sole occupation. I read with ardour those works so full of genius and discrimination which modern inquirers have written on these subjects. I attended the lectures and cultivated the acquaintance of the men of science of the university, and found even in Monsieur Kremp a great deal of sound sense and real information, combined, it is true, with a repulsive physiognomy and manners, but not, on that account, the less valuable. In M. Waltman I found a true friend. His gentleness was never tinged by dogmatism, and his instructions were given with an air of frankness and good nature that banished every idea of pedantry. In a thousand ways he smoothed for me the path of knowledge and made the most abstruse inquiries clear and facile to my apprehension. My application was at first fluctuating and uncertain. It gained strength as I proceeded, and soon became so ardent and eager that the stars often disappeared in the light of morning whilst I was yet engaged in my laboratory. As I applied so closely, it may be easily conceived that my progress was rapid. My ardour was indeed the astonishment of the students, and my proficiency that of the masters. Professor Kremp often asked me, with a sly smile, how Cornelius Agrippa went on, whilst M. Waltman expressed the most heartfelt exultation in my progress. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, but was engaged, heart and soul, in the pursuit of some discoveries which I hoped to make. None but those who have experienced them can conceive of the enticements of science. In other studies you go as far as others have gone before you, and there is nothing more to know. But in scientific pursuit there is continual food for discovery and wonder. A mind of moderate capacity which closely pursues one study must infallibly arrive at great proficiency in that study, and I who continually sought the attainment of one object of pursuit, and was solely wrapped up in this, improved so rapidly that at the end of two years I made some discoveries in the improvement of some chemical instruments which procured me great esteem and admiration at the university. When I had arrived at this point, and had become as well acquainted with the theory and practice of natural philosophy as depended on the lessons of any of the professors at Ingolstadt, my residence there being no longer conducive to my improvements, I thought of returning to my friends and my native town, when an incident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal endued with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which has ever been considered as a mystery. Yet with how many things are we upon the brink of becoming acquainted, if cowardice or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries? I resolved these circumstances in my mind, and determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which related to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to this study would have been irksome and almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. In my education, my father had taken the greatest precautions that my mind should be impressed with no supernatural horrors. I do not even remember to have trembled at a tale of superstition, or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness had no effect upon my fancy and a churchyard was to me merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which, from being the seat of beauty and strength, had become food for the worm. Now I was led to examine the cause and the progress of this decay, and forced to spend days and nights in vaults and charnel houses. My attention was fixed upon every object the most insupportable to the delicacy of human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and the brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutiae of causation, as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life, until, from
from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illuminated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries towards the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not more certainly shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle might have produced it, yet the stages of the discovery were distinct and probable. After days and nights of incredible labour and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay, more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. The astonishment which I had at first experienced on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. After so much time spent in painful labour, to arrive at once at the summit of my desires was the most gratifying consummation of my toils. But this discovery was so great and overwhelming that all the steps by which I had been progressively led to it were obliterated, and I beheld only the result. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. Not that, like a magic scene, it all opened upon me at once. The information I had obtained was of a nature rather to direct my endeavours so soon as I should point them towards the object of my search than to exhibit that object already accomplished. I was like the Arabian, who had been buried with the dead and found a passage to life aided only by one glimmering and seemingly ineffectual light. I see by your eagerness and the wonder and hope which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret with which I am acquainted. That cannot be. Listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am so reserved on that subject. I will not lead you on, unguarded and ardent, as I then was, to your destruction and infallible misery. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example, how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world, than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found so astonishing a power placed within my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the manner in which I should employ it. Although I possessed the capacity of bestowing life, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, with all its intricacies of fibres, muscles and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labour. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler organisation. But my imagination was too much exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt of my ability to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. The materials at present within my command hardly appeared adequate to so arduous an undertaking, but I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. I prepared myself for a multitude of reverses. My operations might be incessantly baffled, and at last my work be imperfect, yet when I considered the improvement which every day takes place in science and mechanics, I was encouraged to hope my present attempts would at least lay the foundations of future success. Nor could I consider the magnitude and complexity of my plan as any argument of its impracticability. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make a being of gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height, and proportionally large. After having formed this determination, and having spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards. Like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success, life and death appeared to me ideal bounds which I should break through and pour a torrent of light into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon lifeless matter, I might in process of time, although I now found it impossible, to renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. These thoughts supported my spirits while I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardour. My cheek had grown pale with study, and my person had become emaciated with confinement. Sometimes, 
on the very brink of certainty, I failed. Yet still I clung to the hope which the next day or the next hour might realize. One secret which I alone possessed was the hope to which I had dedicated myself, and the moon gazed on my midnight labors while, with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness, I pursued nature to her hiding places. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? My limbs now tremble and my eyes swim with the remembrance, but then a resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seem to have lost all soul or sensation but for this one pursuit. It was indeed but a passing trance that only made me feel with renewed acuteness so soon as, the unnatural stimulus ceasing to operate, I had returned to my old habits. I collected bones from the charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all the other apartments by a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were starting from their sockets and attending to the details of my employment. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials, and often did my human nature turn with loathing from my occupation, while still urged on by an eagerness which perpetually increased, I brought my work near to a conclusion. The summer months passed while I was thus engaged, heart and soul, in one pursuit. It was a most beautiful season. Never did the fields bestow a more plentiful harvest, or the vines yield a more luxuriant vintage. But my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature. And the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were so many miles absent, and whom I had not seen for so long a time. I knew my silence disquieted them, and I well remembered the words of my father. I know that while you are pleased with yourself, you will think of us with affection, and we shall hear regularly from you. You must pardon me if I regard any interruption in your correspondence as a proof that your other duties are equally neglected. I knew well, therefore, what would be my father's feelings, but I could not tear my thoughts from my employment, loathsome in itself, but which had taken an irresistible hold of my imagination. I wished, as it were, to procrastinate all that related to my feelings of affection until the great object, which swallowed up every habit of my nature, should be completed. I then thought my father would be unjust if he ascribed my neglect to vice or faultiness on my part, but I am now convinced that he was justified in conceiving that I should not be altogether free from blame. A human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never allow passion or a transitory desire to disturb his tranquillity. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful, that is to say, not befitting the human mind. If this rule were always observed, if no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquillity of his domestic affections, Greece had not been enslaved, Caesar would have spared his country, America would have been discovered more gradually, and the empires of Mexico and Peru had not been destroyed. But I forget that I am moralizing in the most interesting part of my tale, and your looks remind me to proceed. My father made no reproach in his letters, and only took notice of my silence by inquiring into my occupations more particularly than before. Winter, spring, and summer passed away during my labours, but I did not watch the blossom on the expanding leaves, sights which before always yielded me supreme delight, so deeply was I engrossed in my occupation. The leaves of that year had withered before my work drew near a close and now every day showed me more plainly how well I had succeeded. But my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety, and I appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines, or any other unwholesome trade, than an artist occupied by his favourite employment. Every night I was oppressed by a slow fever, and I became nervous to a most painful degree. The fall of a leaf startled me, 
and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I had been guilty of a crime. Sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived that I had become, and the energy of my purpose alone sustained me. My labours would soon end, and I believed that exercise and amusement would then drive away incipient disease, and I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. End of chapter 4 all righty then so we now have victor creating the monster and i don't know about you but the second that he said he was making the creature out of gigantic proportions and he was eight feet tall i immediately thought of terry gar he must have an enormous schwanzstücke <sighs> young frankenstein is really hard to get out of your head when you've seen it over and over and over again and you own the dvd and yes, at some point I'm probably going to record audio from it and, and play parts of it for you, because it's just not possible to not hear Gene Wilder's voice at some moments. So we'll, we'll enjoy that at, at some point. Um, I hope you, you heard um, that he's, he's trying to be quite clear that he's not crazy and that he's also not going to tell Walton the secret to how to give life that he has learned unlike some scientists today that there are some things you simply shouldn't mess with and there is some knowledge that you simply shouldn't pass on i know that oppenheimer created the exploratorium in san francisco partly as a way to pay back humanity for having been involved in creating a nuclear weapon and i think um uh, over time, there have been a number of scientists who kind of wish they could take it back. M Mary Shelley's book, again, is a cautionary tale, and it is a reaction to the age of reason, to a scientific age, to, to a scientific awakening, um, and and discussing the fact that there there may simply be some some rocks under which we should not look and this is this is definitely the beginning of those moments in this book um, i am going to go ahead and play chapter five for you because i can't not i can't make you go through all of that learning about victor and his um uh, his toiling towards this moment without playing the moment for you i'm not going to break into the narrative on this one because it's it's just too good for you to listen to straight through but i do want you to know that this chapter is completely as as the last few chapters have been completely from victor's point of view later in the book you will hear from other points of view and victor's is definitely one-sided. I've said before that I think he's he's rather selfish. He's it's not so much selfish here as it is really messed up. And um anyone who is a parent will hear what I mean as you listen to this chapter. I don't want to give too much away and it's it, it's hard to talk about this one without um without saying there's a lot of foreshadowing in <laughs> in the early part of this book um one of the other things to know is that she will quote mary will quote uh, coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner and i'm thinking maybe when this book is done we'll go back and we'll listen to uh somebody do a recording of the ancient mariner because it's just so bloody good and you'll see why she kept quoting from it over and over and over again um so i i think i'm not gonna i'm looking through the the book itself i just to make sure um, I'm just going to start it for you. I will probably not talk a whole lot about it at the end because uh, it, it, you just simply won't need it. It's it's really a good chapter. And it was always, after doing things like The Scarlet Letter and, and some really heavy and ponderous books, it was always, I know, fun for my kids to finally get a book where, yeah, you have to slog through the first couple chapters, but you get to the good stuff pretty fast in Frankenstein. So if you've hung on this far, this is now where the roller coaster ride really starts. So here we go with chapter five and a completely different reader. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. 
It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavored to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful, great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same color as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. The different accidents of life are not so changeable as the feelings of human nature. I had worked hard for nearly two years for the sole purpose of infusing life into an inanimate body. For this I had deprived myself of rest and health. I had desired it with an ardor that far exceeded moderation. But now that I had finished, the beauty of the dream vanished and breathless horror and disgust filled my heart. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber, unable to compose my mind to sleep. At length, lassitude succeeded to the tumult I had before endured, and I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, endeavoring to seek a few moments of forgetfulness. But it was in vain. I slept, indeed, but I was disturbed by the wildest dreams. I thought I saw Elizabeth, in the bloom of health, walking in the streets of Ingolstadt. Delighted and surprised, I embraced her, but as I imprinted the first kiss on her lips, they became livid with the hue of death. Her features appeared to change, and I thought that I held the corpse of my dead mother in my arms. A shroud enveloped her form, and I saw the grave worms crawling in the folds of the flannel. I started from my sleep with horror. A cold dew covered my forehead, my teeth chattered, and every limb became convulsed. When, by the dim and yellow light of the moon, as it forced its way through the window shutters... I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they may be called, were fixed on me. His jaws opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me, but I escaped and rushed downstairs. I took refuge in the courtyard belonging to the house which I inhabited, where I remained during the rest of the night, walking up and down in the greatest agitation, listening attentively, catching and fearing each sound, as if it were to announce the approach of the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while unfinished. He was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of motion, it became a thing such as even Dante could not have conceived. I passed the night wretchedly, Sometimes my pulse beat so quickly and hardly that I felt the palpitation of every artery. At others, I nearly sank to the ground through languor and extreme weakness. Mingled with this horror, I felt the bitterness of disappointment. Dreams that had been my food and pleasant rest for so long a space were now become a hell to me. And the change was so rapid 
the overthrow so complete. Morning, dismal and wet, at length dawned, and discovered to my sleepless and aching eyes the Church of Ingolstadt, its white steeple and clock which indicated the sixth hour. The porter opened the gates of the court, which had that night been my asylum, and I issued into the streets, pacing them with quick steps, as if I sought to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I did not dare return to the apartment which I inhabited, but felt impelled to hurry on, although drenched by the rain which poured from a black and comfortless sky. I continued walking in this manner for some time, endeavoring by bodily exercise to ease the load that weighed upon my mind. I traversed the streets without any clear conception of where I was or what I was doing. My heart palpitated in the sickness of fear, and I hurried on with irregular steps, not daring to look about me. Like one who on a lonely road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. Coleridge's Ancient Mariner. Continuing thus, I came at length opposite to the inn at which the various diligences and carriages usually stopped. Here I paused, I knew not why, but I remained some minutes with my eyes fixed on a coach that was coming towards me from the other end of the street. As it drew nearer, I observed that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened, I perceived Henry Clerval, who on seeing me instantly sprung out. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed he, how glad I am to see you. How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting. Nothing could equal my delight on seeing Clerval. His presence brought back to my thoughts my father, Elizabeth, and all those scenes of home so dear to my recollection. I grasped his hand, and in a moment forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt suddenly, and for the first time during many months, calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards my college. Clerval continued talking for some time about our mutual friends, and his own good fortune in being permitted to come to Ingolstadt. You may easily believe, said he, how great was the difficulty to persuade my father that all necessary knowledge was not comprised in the noble art of bookkeeping. And indeed, I believe I left him incredulous to the last, for his constant answer to my unwearied entreaties was the same as that of the Dutch schoolmaster and the vicar of Wakefield. I have ten thousand florins a year without Greek. I eat heartily without Greek. But his affection for me at length overcame his dislike of learning, and he has permitted me to undertake a voyage of discovery to the land of knowledge. It gives me the greatest delight to see you, but tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth. Very well and very happy, only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. By the by, I mean to lecture you a little upon their account myself. But, my dear Frankenstein, continued he, stopping short and gazing full in my face, I did not before remark how very ill you appear, so thin and pale. You look as if you had been watching for several nights. You have guessed right. I have lately been so deeply engaged in one occupation that I have not allowed myself sufficient rest, as you see. But I hope... I sincerely hope that all these employments are now at an end and that I am at length free. I trembled excessively. I could not endure to think of, and far less to allude to, the occurrences of the preceding night. I walked with a quick pace, and we soon arrived at my college. I then reflected, and the thought made me shiver, that the creature whom I had left in my apartment might still be there, alive and walking about. I dreaded to behold this monster, but I feared still more that Henry should see him. 
Entreating him, therefore, to remain a few minutes at the bottom of the stairs, I darted up towards my own room. My hand was already on the lock of the door before I recollected myself. I then paused and a cold shivering came over me. I threw the door forcibly open, as children are accustomed to do when they expect a specter to stand in waiting for them on the other side, but nothing appeared. I stepped fearfully in. The apartment was empty and my bedroom was also freed from its hideous guest. I could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me. But when I became assured that my enemy had indeed fled, I clapped my hands for joy and ran down to Clerval. We ascended into my room, and the servant presently brought breakfast. But I was unable to contain myself. It was not joy only that possessed me. I felt my flesh tingle with excess of sensitiveness, and my pulse beat rapidly. I was unable to remain for a single instant in the same place. I jumped over the chairs, clapped my hands, and laughed aloud. Clerval at first attributed my unusual spirits to joy on his arrival. But when he observed me more attentively, he saw a wildness in my eyes for which he could not account, and my loud, unrestrained, heartless laughter frightened and astonished him. "'My dear Victor,' cried he, "'what, for God's sake, is the matter? "'Do not laugh in that manner. "'How ill you are! "'What is the cause of all this?' "'Do not ask me,' cried I, "'putting my hands before my eyes, "'for I thought I saw the dreaded specter "'glide into the room. "'He can tell. "'Oh, save me! "'Save me!' "'I imagined that the monster seized me, I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. Poor Clerval! What must have been his feelings? A meeting which he anticipated with such joy so strangely turned to bitterness. But I was not the witness of his grief, for I was lifeless and did not recover my senses for a long, long time. This was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months. During all that time, Henry was my only nurse. I afterwards learned that knowing my father's advanced age and unfitness for so long a journey, and how wretched my sickness would make Elizabeth, he spared them this grief by concealing the extent of my disorder. He knew that I could not have a more kind and attentive nurse than himself, and firm in the hope he felt of my recovery he did not doubt that instead of doing harm he performed the kindest action that he could towards them but i was in reality very ill and surely nothing but the unbounded and unremitting attentions of my friend could have restored me to life the form of the monster on whom i had bestowed existence was forever before my eyes and i raved incessantly concerning him Doubtless my words surprised Henry. He at first believed them to be the wanderings of my disturbed imagination, but the pertinacity with which I continually recurred to the same subject persuaded him that my disorder indeed owed its origin to some uncommon and terrible event. By very slow degrees and with frequent relapses that alarmed and grieved my friend, I recovered. I remember the first time I became capable of observing outward objects with any kind of pleasure. I perceived that the fallen leaves had disappeared and that the young buds were shooting forth from the trees that shaded my window. It was a divine spring, and the season contributed greatly to my convalescence. I felt also sentiments of joy and affection revive in my bosom. My gloom disappeared, and in a short time I became as cheerful as before I was attacked by the fatal passion. "'Dearest Clerval,' exclaimed I, "'how kind, how very good you are to me. "'This whole winter, instead of being spent in study as you promised yourself, "'has been consumed in my sick room. "'How shall I ever repay you? 
I feel the greatest remorse for the disappointment of which I have been the occasion. But you will forgive me. You will repay me entirely if you do not discompose yourself, but get well as fast as you can. And since you appear in such good spirits, I may speak to you on one subject, may I not? I trembled. One subject. What could it be? Could he allude to an object on whom I dared not even think? Compose yourself, said Clerval, who observed my change of color. I will not mention it if it agitates you. But your father and cousin would be very happy if they received a letter from you in your own handwriting. They hardly know how ill you have been and are uneasy at your long silence. Is that all, my dear Henry? How could you suppose that my first thought would not fly towards those dear, dear friends whom I love and who are so deserving of my love? If this is your present temper, my friend, you will perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from your cousin, I believe. This is the end of Chapter 5. So next week, we hear the letter. Uh, so the monster's awake. And somewhere, and Victor has no idea where, and he's been recuperating for how long now, and still has no idea where. My goodness, he's just not very aware. Please don't forget, if you donate during the month of December, you will be entered into the December drawing for the fabulous Gen Minus Craft Lit Charm. We will get those out to you, and I will read off the November winner of the Craft Lit Charm next week. Have a great week. I will talk to you soon. Please remember to support the people who support Craft Lit. Go to knittingoutloud.com. Listen while you knit. You can find a blog for this podcast at craftlit.blogspot.com or craftlit.libsyn.com. That's craftlit, C-R-A-F-T-L-I-T, all one word, and libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. And of course, you can subscribe at iTunes. Craftlit is supported by the generous donations of its listeners, and for that, I am truly grateful. And do remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.